How you doing high levels and welcome to another video. This video is on topic 13, transition metals. Let's get into the action. Volume 1, first row D block elements, we need to look at properties, ligands, magnetism. IB key understandings and outcomes are listed here and also the applications. We need to know about transition metals, their variable oxidation states, why they form complex ions with ligands, why they're coloured and display catalytic and magnetic properties. We need to be able to explain those oxidation states for ionisation energies. We look at coordinate bonds and coordination numbers. Text ref is page 118, 129. Check it out. Okay, the transition metals. They have a large number of metals that are useful for society. Now we consider the transition elements titanium through to copper um, because these contain elements with at least one stable ion with a partially filled D subshell. Scandium and zinc are not considered transition elements because they don't have a partially filled D orbital as their ions. Remember the exceptions, the chromium exception, it will have a half filled D orbital and a 4S1, it will promote one electron from the 4S to half fill that 3D that 3D orbital, and it's the same with copper. It will have a full 3D orbital by promoting one electron from the 4S, giving it 3D10, 4S1. Zinc will lose two electrons to have a full 3D, so it will have a two plus ion and is not considered a transition metal element. The four main things that we need to know about transition metals are their variable oxidation state, their ability to form complex ions, and one of those is on the right hand side, why they form coloured compounds, and why they have some catalytic properties, and we'll talk about those in this video. So transition metals can form ions with a variable oxidation state, or a variable oxidation number. They can, form, they can all form ions of 2 plus by losing two electrons from the fourth shell. But in addition, they can also lose electrons from the 3D shell to form different oxidation states. So how do the transition metals form these ions? Well, electrons in the 3D subshell have, the 4S subshell, have a little less energy than the 3D subshell, but they're very close in terms of energy. The ions, well, they'll lose them from the 4S first, and then they'll start to lose the 3D. Electrons are always removed from the 4S before the 3D. So a couple of important ions to remember are the chromium with the 6 plus oxidation state, the manganese with the plus 7 oxidation state, and then the coppers as well. Remember that stable D orbitals contain empty half or full orbitals. So let's look at the formation of chromium 6 plus. Now, chromium will usually have the electron configuration of argon, 3D5, 4S1, because it's one of those exceptions. So if I go and put that into my orbital diagram, you can see that my 3D subshell is half filled. Now, if I want to form the ion, I need to lose six electrons. So what will happen is I'll be removing all of those electrons from the 4S and the 3D, which would give it an empty 4S and 3D, which is why it is stable. If we have a look at the manganese, manganese will have the electron configuration of argon, and it will be 4S2, 3D5. Now manganese has a stable oxidation state of 7 plus, so as we go along and look at the orbital diagram, it will lose the electrons from the 4S first, that's 2, and then it will lose all of the 3D orbitals, leaving it with an empty 3D and 4S, giving us the stable oxidation state of plus 7. If we're asked to explain the formation of transition metal ions, we can look at the successive ionisation energies. So here I have a graph of the ionization energies of calcium and titanium. Titanium, a transition metal, calcium, not a transition metal. We can see that the trend for ionization energies of titanium increases until the fourth ionization and then rises steeply. For calcium, we have two ionizations which are fairly low and then a large jump in the ionization energy.
If we look at the electron configurations, argon has the 3D2-4S2 and calcium has the argon-4S2. So if we're to try and lose two electrons from calcium, we take both of those out of the fourth shell, but then the third ionization would be coming from the 3P subshell. The 3P has a lot larger energy than a 4S, so it's going to be a lot harder to remove an electron from the 3 P. If we're looking at titanium, well titanium has four electrons that are fairly easy to remove and then the fifth one is very hard. That's because we'll start to lose two electrons from the 4s first from titanium, so they're those two, and then we'll start to lose electrons from the 3d. Now the 4s and the 3d they're very similar in energy level. Once we get to the fifth electron, that's where we're trying to take that electron out of a 3p, which is why it's a lot harder to remove. That it has a lot lower energy, a lot closer to the nucleus, so it's physically going to require a lot more energy to remove a 3p electron from a titanium ion. Moving on, we need to talk about the magnetism of the transition metals. And there's three types of classifications, diamagnetic, paramagnetic, or ferromagnetic. Diamagnetic is basically an opposition to a magnetic field. You oppose it. Paramagnetic produces an attraction that is proportional to the magnetic field strength. So it's attracted. And transition metal complexes with unpaired electrons display paramagnetism. Ferromagnetism only belongs to iron, cobalt and nickel and it's because these domains, these sections of the crystal lattice, they all align due to large numbers of unpaired electrons. So in iron, cobalt and nickel, those domains can line up with the field and it produces a much stronger attraction to the magnetic field. If we have a look at a couple of examples, copper one oxide, would that be magnetic? Well, we need to go through and do the electron configuration. Copper would have the electron configuration of 4s1, 3d10, it's one of those exceptions. Now, if copper plus ions formed, it's going to lose one electron from the 4s shell, giving it a full 3d. It has paired electrons, so it's going to be diamagnetic. Copper is non metallic non it's not a magnetic metal and it would be diamagnetic. If we look at manganese 2 chloride, the next one. So manganese has the 4s1 3d5 configuration. If it forms a 2 plus ion, 3 plus ion, sorry about that, it will lose 3 electrons from its shells. It will lose two from the four, one from the 4s and 2 from the 3d, giving it 3 unpaired electrons. That means that it will be paramagnetic. Unpaired electrons is paramagnetism. The final one, nickel nitrate. If we have a look at the electron configuration of nickel, but before we do that, the formula for nickel nitrate would be NiNO32. Nickel has the electron configuration 4s2, 3d, no, 8, 3d8, 4s2, 3d8. Now it's got to lose two electrons, so it will lose both of those electrons from the 4s, giving it some paired electrons and some unpaired electrons. So you might think that's paramagnetic. No, it's ferromagnetic because, because nickel, iron and cobalt have that property of being ferromagnetic. So now we need to have a look at how the transition metals interact with a molecule called a ligand. Usually transition metals are small and highly charged in terms of charge density. They have a large charge and a small radius. So they're able to form a complex ion, which is a coordinate bond. A coordinate bond is where a ligand, a small charged ion, is able to donate an electron pair. 
So the copper ion attracts, or the, the metal ion attracts that electron pair, and the ligand donates that electron pair in a coordinate bond. Remember the definition of a coordinate bond is a bond formed when one of the atoms supplies both electrons of the shared pair, and that was something that came up in topic four. So here we have some typical ligands, and they all have lone pairs that they could donate to a metal ion. Some of them are charged and some of them are uncharged. In the data booklet, it gives you a, a series of all the different types of ligands you could expect. Iodine has, is a low energy ligand and cyanide is a high energy ligand, which we'll talk about later. When we draw these though, we have to try and indicate that it's the lone pair that would be attracted to the metal ion. So the molecules that surround the metal ions are in a complex are called ligands. The interactions between a metal atom and a ligand can be thought of as an acid, a Lewis acid base reaction. Now a Lewis acid is an electron pair acceptor. A Lewis base is an electron pair donor. This comes up in topic 18 of the higher level course, but it's just something to think about here. Our metal ions will be Lewis bases sorry, our ligands will be Lewis bases, our metals will be Lewis acids. We have these things called monodentate ligands, which can donate one pair of electrons. We also have these ligands which are called bidentate, which can donate two pairs of electrons. Those are sometimes called chelating agents because they grab the metal ion kind of like a claw. Moving further on from the ligands, we need to talk about coordination number. Now, coordination number is the number of ligands that surrounds the metal ion. So if the, the metal ion is generally surrounded by between two and six ligands in a complex, but most of the time we can have two, four, or six. If we have two ligands surrounding a metal ion, that's referred to as a linear complex. For four, four ligands surrounding a metal, we have two possibilities. We have the tetrahedral arrangement or the square planar arrangement. You won't be asked to determine which ones form square planar, which one's called tetrahedral, but if you are given something with four ligands, there are two ways to draw it. If a metal ion is surrounded by six ligands, it's described as being octahedral. Octahedral because if we draw in the shape, we actually have an octahedron which has eight faces. So it's called an octahedral arrangement. Another one of the properties of the transition metals is their ability to act as catalysts. Basically a catalyst is a surface which provides an alternative pathway for a reaction to occur. Now these solids, they usually have what we call a high surface energy. So when a molecule sticks to the surface, it creates a weaker bond within the molecule. And then when a collision occurs, it's easier to break the bonds within the molecule. So the transition metals act as catalysts. A couple that the IB would like you to know is the decomposition of hydrogen peroxide to water and oxygen gas. That is the use of manganese dioxide, MnO2, which is a black fine powder. Vanadium 5 oxide is used in the conversion of gases in the contact process. The contact process is used to make sulfuric acid and iron is the catalyst in the harbour process. A heterogeneous catalyst is a catalyst that is in the same state as the reactants and products. A homo homogeneous, sorry, heterogeneous is in a different state, homogeneous is in the same state. Here's a few practice questions. We might be asked to determine the oxidation state of transition metal ions. So we go through and we look at the overall charge and then we try and work out the oxidation state. Draw the following complex ions. Hex, hex, hexa, aqua, copper, two iron. Hexa means six. So we have six water molecules surrounding the copper ion. So we're going to have that octahedral set up. So what I will do first is I'll draw my four waters in a square planar arrangement, and then I'll draw my two water molecules above and below. And you can see here, there's my kind of square. I've got my water above, my water below, but when I connect them up to the metal, 
they're actually connected in a diagonal. So that is my complex hexa copper two hexa aqua copper two ion, and I need to include the two positive charge. The next one, tetraamine diaqua copper two ion. Again, the copper two ion has a two plus charge. Tetra meaning four, di meaning two. So I have four amine groups and two water groups. Don't really know where these ones will go, so it's not gonna be important about which one goes where, just as long as we have the right numbers in the right spots. Six ligands, again, is gonna take the octahedral setup. So here I've drawn my four ammonias in my square planar and my two waters above and below, giving me my octahedral setup. Again, I need to include the charge. The charge will be two plus. Question three, consider the following complex ions and predict the shape. So here we have CuF42 minus. Well, that's going to be tetrahedral or it could possibly be square planar, not too sure. Silver hydroxide with the minus charge, well, it's got two ligands, it will be negatively charged. Question four, a complex ion formed between Fe3 plus and the ligand Cn minus. Have a go at that, bring it to class and we'll see how we've gone. Draw the structure, describe the shape, explain. Okay, some top tips for volume one for the transition metals. Start with the electron configuration, remove them from the 4S first. Remember those exceptions. Thanks for watching guys. Don't forget, drop a like on the video, subscribe if you're new, and I'll see you.